come up afterwards if there's a bit of time to have a little little look. So. I think I'll start, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Lovely to see you all. Hope you're enjoying Amiga Island so far. Um, unfortunately, my voice is probably a bit faint from uh, last night's uh, activities. <laughs> so uh, it's a bit threadbare. Uh, personally, I blame Trevor for everything. So, <laughs> um, But uh, basically, I'm, I'm Vicky, Pixel Vixen. Um, I do pixel art, as I'm sure you're probably all aware. That's why you're here. Um, and um, <coughs> I'm just going to grab my notes so I stay relatively on course. Um, so, yeah, so basically I got this actual very Amiga 600 in 1993. It was my first Amiga. Um, and uh, amazingly, unlike all the others, which either died and then were sent to the tip, and uh, obviously now sit probably about 30 feet under the ground, um, this one stayed with me. And... A couple of years ago, um, I was pretty burnt out from my work and I just wanted to play some games and just chill out a bit, you know? And um, I dug the Amiga out and I was very worried that maybe when I plugged it in, it would blow up in my face because <laughs> it probably hadn't been switched on for the best part of 10 years. And, and to my amazement, it worked. And as I played with it more, I thought, well, I used to always do pixel art and stuff like that and it occurred to me that it'd be quite nice to do a little YouTube channel. There might be five people, um, three of them subscribed by mistake, myself and my mum, who might be interested in me doing some pixel art on an old retro system, if we can use that, that phrase. And, um, and to my surprise, uh, there was more than five people. And, and the last couple of years have really just been an exploration of basically creating artwork on a system that I'm incredibly fond of. Um, I stuck with the Amiga until about the year 2000. Admittedly, it was more of a shapeshifter machine by then for Macintosh emulation, but I did stick through uh, to the very last days of the Amiga's commercial lifespan, as it were. And um, so it was nice to actually get back to uh, some of my roots with uh, computer graphics because um, all of what I've done in terms of my career, regardless of how I view that career at this particular point in time, has been thanks to this machine. So um, I'm incredibly fond of it, and that's why instead of perhaps focusing on just doing stuff in a sprite, which is a modern pixel art package which you can get for your Mac, Linux, Windows, etc., I do tend to do most of my pixel art on here. Um, it's a fairly stock Amiga 600. It has an extra megabyte of chip RAM and it has an extra two megabytes of fast RAM in the PCMCIA slot. But otherwise, uh, it's pretty stock. Uh, there is no accelerator in here because, to be honest with you, even if I put an O20 or a Vampire in here, I wouldn't be able to draw any quicker than what I do at the moment. So, <laughs> so maybe that's the thing, uh, is that we live in a world where there's loads of applications that you could use this, it's going to make it easier, and maybe it will, but you can use a pretty basic Amiga, Amiga 500 with 512K of RAM and D-Paint 2, and you'll still be able to create beautiful 32 color images. Um, your animation potential might be a bit limited, but don't be, you know, sort of uh, convince yourself that you need a, a fast Amiga to be able to create beautiful pixel art, because yes, it'll make using Workbench a little bit slicker, but ultimately, uh, the slowest thing is going to be uh, your hand and your mouse movement. So, so this is a pretty basic machine. Um, I tend to use Dulux Paint the most. Um, do, do, do any of you use any other packages at all? Shout them out. Brilliance. Oh, Brilliance, yeah, that's an amazing package. Personal Paint. Yeah, Personal Paint. Yeah, so there's loads of packages to do because the Brilliance was one that came sort of towards the very latter days of Commodore's existence in about 93, wasn't it? Uh, Digital Creations, wasn't it? something like that, yeah. Uh, I think they did the, um, what was the 
the thing that they did. But anyway, regardless, but the good good software company, also excellent. So if you can find Brilliance, I mean, obviously, you can download it these days. Or can you? Mm. Uh, so, <laughs> nobody heard that. Um, but you you can find it. It's a superb package. Uh, Personal Paint, obviously, I think you can download version 7.1 from Aminet for free. Uh, it's a good version. Uh, you, uh, to be honest with you, it's just my nostalgia for using Dulux Paint and the fact that I know it pretty much like the back of my hand is why I stuck with it. Um, but there's no rights or wrongs. There's loads of other packages out there. XI Paint was another one that I reminded myself of when I was flicking through some old Amiga magazines. Um, there's tons of them. So um, I tend to use Dulux Paint AGA. Uh, it will run on OCS, ECS Amiga, as long as you've got Workbench 2. Um, just because it's the most well-rounded package, it'll run quite happily in 2 meg of RAM. Um, I quite happily use my Amiga 600 because it's easy to expand to 2 mega chip RAM for animation. Uh, you've got the PCMCIA for easy file transfer. If you're considering, well, what Amiga should I do this on? Of course, you can do it on a 500, but transferring those files might necessitate an extra bit of hardware to swap the files in and out, so because uh, you're not going to be really readily able to re read Amiga floppy disks that easily these days on a non-Amiga device. So, so that's why I stick with the 600 both personal connection and the fact that it's a very functional tool. Um, so that's basically what I do. Um, in terms of um, resolutions and colours, so I'm just going to load up D-Paint. Well, obviously, it'll be much clearer up in here. So uh, I'm just going to crane over here, like so. Um, so it's very cheap and easy to pick up. Do let's paint with a manual. You can usually find it on eBay, particularly D-Paint free for maybe five to ten pounds. Um, it's going to support all your OCS and ECS stuff. Um, it doesn't support the AGA screen modes, but it's perfectly decent. It'll do all your animation and has perhaps 90, 95% of the, the tools you're going to use every day. Um, ordinarily on your OCS and ECS Amigas, um, you'll probably have uh, 30, well, you will have 32 color, no resolution. And then there's a special mode called Extra Half Bright. I'm going to show you some Extra Half Bright stuff today. And you've also got the hand modes. Uh, D-Paint 3 doesn't support hand, but I'm not really going to show you necessarily a lot of hand stuff, or any hand stuff really today. But um, So there are uh, colour limitations, as I'm sure you're well aware with, with using an older system, and also resolution as well. So if you want to go into high-res interlace, not only are you going to burn your retinas out uh, from the flicker, but you're also going to be limited to 16 colours. So... Um, but whereas if you get yourself a 1200 or a 4000 or one of these vampires that have got AGA in it or whatever, you're going to be able to use 256 colours uh, in any screen mode. So, um, But in a way, having a limited colour palette is a good way to start because if you're just at the very beginning of this, one of the things that people say is that I've got too many colours. How do I mix nice colours and stuff like this? So actually having a slightly more limited colour palette helps concentrate the mind and get your mind into you know, spotting the difference in tones and so forth. So I'm just going to bring up a, just a little low-res screen here, uh, 32 colours. Um, so in terms of mixing colours, this is the first thing I'm going to talk about because uh, without nice colours, you're probably not going to be able to, uh, you know, get the visual uh, look that you want. So um, do it paint like any good application is full of uh, shortcuts. So you can obviously go up to colour, and then you've got palette and then uh, mix, is it? Yeah, there you go, mixer. Or you can use the P key on your keyboard. Um, so, do its paint works much better when you know it's keyboard shortcuts. It's much quicker, and there are some <coughs> things which you can't do through the user interface without using the keyboard. So, and I'll be showing you some of those as well. But a lot of you will be familiar with the RGB way of um, um, uh, mixing colours. So, I'm just going to do some amazing artwork here. So I hope that by the end of today, you'll all be able to do this extraordinary piece here. Um, just don't use a flood fill too much. It might crash. No, it doesn't. But sorry. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm calling back to the Amiga's launch, uh, Debbie Warhol and uh, uh, Andy Warhol, where they are uh, uh, painting and they're worried about the flood fill crashing the machine. But RGB is not necessarily the most efficient way of mixing colours. Um, it can be a bit obtuse to get your head around because like, if you want uh, yellow, you've got to mix in... Uh, you know the, the the red channel as well, and then if you want to make it more pastel, you've got to introduce blue. It's it's um, it can be a bit counterintuitive uh, if you're not familiar with it. So what I recommend is clicking onto this little button here. Um, it's already present in D Paint Freeze Palette Requester. You don't have to toggle, um, and likewise D Paint Five shows basically RGB and HSV. 
uh, in one go. But this allows you to mix colours using hue, saturation and value. Sometimes value is referred to as luminance or uh, luminosity. Um, but basically, if you think of the hue as being like a rainbow spectrum, which extends from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to violet, and basically wraps back around again uh, to red. And this is always consistent. You always know, roughly within the rainbow, as it were, where that colour is going to be. So if I want to mix up a, a minty green, I know that I'm going to bring the hue somewhere around sort of between the blues and the greens there. And then you've got your saturation, so how much of that particular hue do you want? Do you want quite a lot so it you know, zaps off the page with your 80s retro wave vibe? Or do I want something a little bit more subtle? <coughs> so I'm going for something a little bit more subtle. I, I want it to be a little bit more pastel, as I say, so I'm just going to get this in the right area. And then you've got your uh, luminance or your value, which is the brightness, essentially, of that shade. So obviously, if you bring the, that right up, it's going to head more towards the white spectrum. It's going to stand off the screen more. But as you drag down that value or the luminance, it's going to eventually fade to black. And this is a much more consistent way of being able to mix colours. It seems like a slightly dry topic to start with, but without good colours, you're going to always be struggling to get it right. And I really do feel that if you learn HSV colour or HSL colour, you're going to be headed in the right direction uh, from the very beginning. So I would definitely play around with the colours. Again, the beauty of OCS ECS Amigas is that you've got a 4096 colour palette, and it's 4-bit RGB, so it means that the red and the green and the blue <coughs> channels have basically 0 to 15 in terms of steps of the intensity of that channel. And what it means is, compared to your modern systems, there's a, a noticeable jump between shades. Um, but it's quite handy when you're first starting out, because sometimes that little nuance is something that you can't quite see until you get used to it. So it's quite a good way to learn. And, and actually, it pushes you to sort of, how can I mix these colours better and so forth. So there's plenty of that kind of. So, so that's uh, how I mix colour. Um, now, I mix colours as I go along when I'm creating something. So usually what I'll do is I'll set the canvas to be a, a grey colour. So I'm just going to swap these. Uh, exchange. Because drawing onto um, a, a bright colour can be quite bad for the eyes, really. So sometimes just tone it down a bit is going to make it less, less harsh. But the important thing to remember, particularly if you're creating a piece of artwork that might be for a game, or if you're going to be um, cutting the brushes out, is don't use the first colour in the palette, because that's going to be essentially a transparent colour in most cases. You can change what the transparent colour is in Dulux Paint, um, but really when it comes to ensuring if you're creating a piece of uh, artwork for a game, whether it's a sprite, or if it's uh, tile maps, or if it's a bitmap to be shown behind some graphics, you don't want to be uh, really changing colour zero, because ideally you will want to set that back to black, because otherwise you'll end up with, the, as you can see here, these grey borders around things, which looks a bit unsightly. Um, so don't use colour zero, but I always start with a, a quite a neutral grey or maybe a slightly tinged yellow sort of canvas because it's less, less eye strain. Um, and then basically what I'll do from there is I will have a colour of the palette um, that stands out quite nice, like a, a, a sort of like a quite a zingy blue. And at the top here you have your, your brush sizes. There are some useful shortcuts in Dirt's Paint Nose, so you've got the full stop or the period which will basically give you a one pixel width brush. And as you can see, adding to my extraordinary piece of artwork here, uh, it's just quicker than having to move your mouse up to here all the time. You've also got the plus and minus keys, so you can just hit plus and you can get your gradually bigger brush. Um, and obviously minus does the other thing, and, and then full stop or period will take you back to one pixel. So keyboard shortcuts are very much your friend. Um, so essentially what I do when I'm looking to create um, something, I'm going to go to load, uh, brush. Actually, I'm going to load this as a picture. Uh, I would drag this onto the app icon on the workbench, but the last time I did this at Swag, it actually crashed the machine. It's never done it since, but I don't want to do it now because otherwise it could be just like guru time. So, um, But basically, when I'm sketching out something, I will draw the outline first. And uh, if I come into here, uh, there it is, load this in, yeah why not, we're going to change the, the colours. So I usually start with a, 
a less colour screen, so like four or maybe eight colours, just because it runs a bit faster. Um, I'm just going to quickly recolour so it stands out a bit more. Uh, oh, hang on. Shift. There you go. Click that. I'm going to show you what I'm doing in a moment with these stencils because they're extremely powerful. Oh, I've done it wrong. Invert, make, like so. Okay, so you can see that bit better now. So I will start with the outline, and I use the line tool for this. So obviously you've got your line tool up here, um, but you can also use V on the keyboard. Vertical, I think, is basically the sort of mnemonic. Uh, say that after a few. Um, so basically uh, this allows me to just rough out the, the outline and so forth. Uh, and you might be wondering, why do I have a line at the bottom here? Well, basically that line is 64 pixels wide, I think, uh, from memory. Um, which is quite important when you're doing game art because obviously you're constrained sometimes between, you know, sort of like how much information can I throw at the screen quickly without it flickering or, you know, you know, coming in really slowly. So I usually just draw a little line and I always have my coordinates turned on at the top right here in the press menu because this will help you position things. So, and, uh, so that's basically what that little line is there. And so, yeah, I just draw out my little outline and then... You know, I can bring in the magnifier, so you can obviously use the little widget on the toolbar and click in and you can use your line tool. Now, the reason I use the line tool is that I just get a little bit more fidelity than using the freehand, because the freehand is like, it all goes all over the place. Whereas with the line tool, after a little while, you'll get quite good at doing curves with it, getting stepping right, and I'm going to show you some slides of how I step lines to make them look smooth. Um, and then obviously anti-aliasing is an extension of that. Uh, which is where you smooth out lines, but I'll show you that as well. But I can tweak that, and with Do Let's Paint, again, keyboard, shortcuts, if you position your mouse over what you want to zoom in and press M, it will zoom into that particular part of the picture. Very, very handy. And you've also got a shortcut that is not available in the user interface at all, the N key. And you can basically position your mouse on the left-hand side over what you're interested in, hit M, <coughs> and it will recenter the magnifier. So this is going to allow you to move much quicker than using your cursor keys, um, that's if they want to work at all. But um, And you've also got your zoom in and out, so you can see more of the magnified view. So, super helpful to get your initial outline in. And then really from there, you can quite easily start flood filling things, you know, to shade things in. Um, and then eventually what you'll end up with, um, if I bring in an animation, so just got to get to the right folder again. By the way, if you've got any questions, guys, do shout out. Um, uh, I will leave time at the end for questions as well, but I... This isn't a lecture. <laughs> yes? Is there an incremental zoom out, zoom out shortcut? Good question. I would, maybe the plus and minus keys do this. No, there might be. I'll have to check it in the oh, okay. DPEG manual. I'm sure there probably is a true snow, and I've just kind of not used it so I know many but not all so um, so yeah so yeah very good question but yeah do look in the back of the deep manual because it has all those shortcuts so if I load in uh, a partial uh, piece of progress on this so I just use grayscale because again grayscale is quite good at looking at shading of things uh, rather than complicating things with colour. One of the things that people always said about photography was is that actually you can learn a lot about light by actually starting with black and white photography because you'll be more interested in looking at the shadows and the highlights and the mid-tones of your image and what kind of lighting you're going to position a portrait, you know, a su your subject in. Uh, if it's a landscape, you'll wait for the correct time of day or when shadows are landing where you want them to be. So you don't just go out in the middle of the day and think, ah, that'll do. You wait till the evening or you, you get up early in the morning because you know the light is going to be hitting the right spot. And with black and white, you're just looking at basically brightness or luminance. And uh, it's a, a good way of studying things. So I sometimes, uh, initially, before I start applying colour to pixel art, I'll actually do it in grayscale. Um, so let me just load that. Um, I'm not saying that this is the right way to do it. I'm just saying that this is the extraordinarily convoluted way that I do it. <laughs> but I enjoy it. So um, where is it? Anim, anim sprites. And work files. Which one am I going to go for? I don't think it is actually those. I think it is just here. Yeah. Okay, great. 
So, this might take a few seconds to load, but whilst it's loading on the screen, you'll be able to see some frames of animation appearing, which gives me a chance to talk over the top of it. So here you can see that basically this is the same character, Landmark, and I've just used basically grayscale. Uh, it's very simple, um, and then I can easily apply some anti-aliasing on it, which I'll talk you through in a moment. Um, and it's quite easy to sort of, you know, FUD fill in your characters once you've got that outline right. Um, I'm going to show you the, the trick of how to get those nice lines in a moment as well. But you can see how grayscale is a, a really good way of just getting the shading in and so forth. And, um, and then obviously you can apply colour quite easily on top of this. Now obviously if you're using something like Duet's Paint, it's going to take you a little while to shade in each uh, uh, cell or frame. Um, but um, if you're just replacing the colours that you've actually shaded with grey, it doesn't actually take too long. Uh, the only downside is because obviously I've anti aliasing for the grey, as soon as I change the colours, obviously all the anti aliasing was going funky colours as well. So. But anyway, um, so yeah, so that's basically how I start with doing these things. So, um, so yeah, so that's sort of like how I start with a character. I'm just going to stop that loading there. Spacebar will stop an action in Dulux Paint, by the way. So you know sometimes when you're sat at your Amiga 500 and you click the flood fill and you forgot, ah, I've got that gradient on it, and you're waiting for it to paint the gradient that you don't want, and you hit an escape and it's not doing anything, just hit the spacebar, that'll stop it. <coughs> So, and likewise, if you're loading an animation or a file that you've got the wrong one, it's taking forever to do it, spacebar will cancel the action. So. And then what you can do from there, just to complete this little uh, arc of what I'm going through, um, actually, I'm just going to load this so you can see it actually running. Um, example art. Um, what am I doing for time? Oh, I'm going to speed up a little bit, actually, guys, because I don't want to completely... Monopolised. Um, I think it's that one there. So by mixing those skills of mixing colour, working with limited colour palettes, you can draw a background. Um, basically, I draw most things with a line tool. If any of you want to see the work files of how I get to what you see on the screen, just come and see me afterwards, and I'll be more than happy to show you. Or I'll give you my Twitter handle, and you're more than welcome to get in touch with me. But essentially, the final piece is uh, all coloured in with the characters and so forth. And I've got the background there. And by keeping the palette separated, which I will show you a couple of slides about as well, you're able to animate quite easily over the top mm. and uh, create a little, uh, little cute animation. Now, I do these things because I can't really program to do all of this stuff. So I just do it in deep eight. And uh, yeah, and it's just all from those basic principles of using that line tool. And uh, it'll take you to Places which are in your imagination, which is fabulous, so, and then it just repeats. So, uh, yeah, so this one took a little while, um, but um, it's fun to do it. So it's just building up step by step. Don't go straight in there thinking, I'm going to draw the background and the sprites, and I'm going to do all this, and I'm going to... It just gets too complicated. So just build up from bit by bit. And I always keep my characters in a different part of the palette, so maybe I'll have those colours in the first 16, and then I'll have the background in the second set of 16 colours, and that way, it keeps things nice and separate. So if I ever need to cut out these characters in the background, and yes, I might have to patch that background in, but at least I don't have to fine tune you know, my way of cutting it out. And I will try and show you stencils um, and how that works as well. So that's sort of like a, a completed animation of sorts. So in terms of those skills of drawing lines and getting nice lines for your initial outline, um, I'm just going to... Um, load in um, some slides of which I put into a, a video about top tips of pixel art which you can find on YouTube um, so let's go back back oops uh, presentations Amiga Island is it there Oh, here we go. Yeah. So I've just done this as, a, a, as an anim file, not because it's animated, just because it's a, a cheap way of making slides on a natural Amiga. <laughs> so we'll just let this load in. So this video is actually on YouTube where I explain this as well, but I'll try and add a bit more to what you hear in the video. So, OK. So I think that's pretty much there. Okie dokies. So can I just skip quite a few frames? So lines. So in fact, actually, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll just see a little outline that will eventually fill in as, as these frames progress. 
Uh, it's a little bit like those flipbook things. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, if I go full screen here, so F10 to go full screen. Um, what you want to do is, and this, this is really important for Pixar, is to try and get nice even stepping. So if we look at the left-hand column, you can see these examples of where the, the line is just not smooth. It just looks jagged, it's jumping about all over the place. And the reason for that is that you're swapping between two to one to two to one pixels, that very top example. But to smooth out the curve, all you have to do is basically start with two pixels going across, and then move up one, two pixels across, and then gradually step it in. So that way you end up with a much smoother curve. The same thing applies to the next example, where you're just drawing that line, and it looks a bit rough and ready. But just by basically having the smooth graduation of these numbers stepping down or stepping up, it doesn't always have to just increment or decrement by one. It could just be by two pixels at a time or something like that. But as long as you're not yo-yoing between how many pixels you're sort of swapping between, you're going to start getting much smoother lines. And this seems like a slightly odd thing to get your head around to start with, but I think we've all drawn something before. It's a bit scrappy around the edge there. An example of that would be here, for example. So essentially it's the same image, but with uneven stepping. And I think we've all done something like this and thought, mm -hmm doesn't quite look right. But by basically using even stepping in our actual graduations of the lines and stuff, we're able to affect a much straighter line. In fact, I've made a mistake here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've not changed that one. So you can see how that eyebrow just looks. Um, not quite so good. Um, but yeah, so that's the kind of principle. And once you start getting the hang of this bit, your peak is going to start really beginning looking a lot tighter. So just a bit of practice, just do a simple outline, black and white. It doesn't have to be anything too special. Um, so anti-aliasing. So once you've got your lines looking nice and smooth, one of the things that you'll notice is, is that, like for example, <coughs> the top, it does look quite blocky. Sometimes it's actually an aesthetic choice. You might want it to look blocky. That's what you're going for. It's a bit like um, um, you know, games like Shovel Knight. I don't know if any of you guys have played that, but it's got that very NES aesthetic with a bit of extra pizzazz on it. But it's deliberately not anti alias because they wanted to, to get that nostalgia into it. So anti aliasing is something that's a very much an artistic choice. But if you do want to use it, um, essentially what you're using it is, is the midtones between, uh, say, your line and your, your smoothing out that transition of what you're going into. So, so in this case, it's just a grey background. But basically, by using the mauve tones just around the edge of that curve, I've been able to make it look a lot smoother. And particularly when you look at it on a CRT. I mean, I've actually doubled the size of these pixels here to make it clearer. But it's just going to make it a lot smoother. And it's something that's going to take quite a bit of time to tweak. But there's a few little techniques for doing it, which I can show you. Um, so anti-aliasing can be achieved with a few like, two colours, essentially, to smooth out that line. So. On the left-hand side, I've got an example with three colours, and essentially this column here is where there's no anti-aliasing. But by simply changing even just the colour of the line, I can make it look darker. Um, uh, but uh, actually, it's not. Sorry, I've not changed colours at all. Just by using one pixel of the darker tone and putting a lighter pixel just to the right of it, actually makes it look a lot smoother. But also, you get this sort of like trick of the eyes, which it fooled me. It's the same colour tone but it actually makes the line look a little bit lighter, so you can actually mix colours almost, which is a subject I probably won't have time to go into today with Paul Differing. But you can actually essentially get the illusion there be many more colours on the screen than there really are. But just with that very simple technique, which I think anybody would be able to do, you can just smooth out that transition. It's a very, very effective way of doing it. Another method, which I use sometimes, is what I call bridging the gap. It's not a proper term, it's just a term that I use for want of a better one. Again, I'm using uh, just four colours to smooth out that line. And what I've done here is instead of it just stepping straight across like so, I've actually just pulled a lighter tone just across these two pixels here. And what it gives is this nice little smooth curve at the top there. So, so simple to do, but extremely effective. And when applied consistently, that's what's going to make your pixel art look so much more fulfilling to you to look at but also more professional so and I think that's actually there's a distinction between fulfillment with what you do and professionalism so as long as you fulfill what you're doing who cares what anybody else says <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah it anti-aliasing sometimes you think oh I'm gonna have to need to have 16 shades of grey and I'm gonna have to have pixels here and a pixel there and keep it simple because actually you will start seeing actually what works visually because it's like a trick of the eye almost really and uh, 
Yeah, and then you can just gradually build it up and then eventually you'll have some nice smooth looking stuff. So, um, for example here, um, you know, I've been able to just use eight colours to sort of like affect sort of, I was trying to see, well if I was doing like a, a, a play field for a dual play field game on the Amiga, an OCS, ECS one, what could I get out of eight colours? And here I was able to use the pink tones, which I'd use for these little sort of like, sort of like uh, fantasy hills or something like that, a little bit like you might see in something like Fantasy Zone, actually thinking about it. Or, um, what's the other game? Think of Twinkle, no, not Twinkle Star Sprite. Um, Pop and Twinbee, Rainbow Bell Adventures. So, but I was able to use those pink tones to sort of smooth out the, the, the cloud a little bit and so forth. So you can share those colours. So you might not think, well, I'm going to anti-alias grey with pink but you'd be surprised what you can do. And just by starting simply, you, you, you get used to how colour and the way you perceive colour works, um, which is, I find it really fun personally, so, um, as you might have guessed. Um, and then, so, a few little basic tips about sketching, which I think we've already covered with the single pixel, using the vertical line tool. And so what I will tend to do is I'll tend to use something called a stencil. Now, if I don't get time to go through it fully, I will point you to my YouTube channel. There's a full video on stencils there. But what this allows me to do is essentially separate out key components of a picture that I'm drawing. So I might draw the character's face using like a, a blue or any colour that stands out against the grey, just to sketch in, and I'll just get it right and so forth. And then when I'm happy with it, I can either use a stencil to automatically colour it all in black, if that's the colour I want, or I can just go over it um, whilst protecting that, that, that blue colour. So I hope I get time to do it, but if not, come and grab me. I might be able to show you. If not, I'll point you to a YouTube video. But sketching is a really important part of this. So before I do like a full screen piece of pixel art, I'll often sketch it out on paper. Um, but yeah, sketching is really important. Don't go straight in there and think, yeah, I'm going to get the final piece now. So, and uh, yeah, so basically, sketch it out to start with, get a sense of proportion, can I fit it all in? If I can't, maybe shrink it down a little bit and it'll all start looking a lot tighter. Oops. Okay, so this is uh, about the non destructive part. I'll come to separately. So that's, I'll sure touch upon palette management if I get some time. Um, okay, so. And then what else we got here? Pretty good with that, actually. So uh, just to recap some of the Amiga's colour specs if you're going to be using an Amiga, which presumably you might be. Oops. Let's load this in D-Paint. <laughs> load. Okay. Do, 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 do. Um, I can obviously share any of these slides or anim files with you. Oh, actually, this is not the file I thought it was. Sorry. <laughs> it's a bit boring, isn't it? <laughs> um, ah, there it is. So I said earlier on that I tend to try and allocate a part of the palette for different parts. Now this is actually quite important when it comes to, say for example, if you're doing a game or you're doing game art for somebody else, uh, for an Amiga or any other system, there'll be restrictions sometimes of where you can use colour and where those colours are going to be applied to, like which colour sprites and so forth. So let's just go to the first frame. So to go to the first frame is always shift and one. F10. There we go. Cool. So here, what I'm showing is that this graphic, and I'll show you the full version at the end, <coughs> is essentially a background which is composed of 15 colours. The, one, the, the bright green one there is just got a little stripe through to show I'm not using it. Quite often when I've uh, got colours that I'm not using, I'll make them a hideous colour that I'm not actually using, like lime green, so that I know exactly what I've not used in the palette. Otherwise, if you leave them with like, the default deep paint shades, you can sometimes accidentally start using them. And then when you go to sort of think, oh, I've run out of colours, but that's actually because you've just used a few of the grey tones you don't actually need, for example. So I tend to colour it a hideous colour so that I know that when I want to go into it, I'm going to have to change that colour and you know, make use of it, as it were. So, and then the foreground is basically 15 colours, and you can see I've got a stripe through on the very first colour, colour zero, uh, because you don't want to be using that, as I say, because you want to generally keep that as your transparent colour, or basically the colour that's going to essentially be black, so you don't end up with grey borders around everything. And then by separating it out, uh, oh, actually, I've got that on a separate thing, so I'll show you that. Um, the other thing uh, with um, OCS, ECS, I mean, is the first 16 colours, uh, you can use those uh, for bitmaps, you know, sort of tile maps, you know, basically anything you've got on the screen, 
you know, if you're blitting it onto the screen, you can use those colours, not a problem. But when it comes to sprites on the Amiga, they use a second set of 16 colours. Um, so the very first and second sprite we use colours 16, 17, 18 and 19 and so on and so forth until you get up to the 7th and 8th sprite which use, uses the last four colours. Um, so you've got to be a little bit careful about how you use those because you might be tempted to say, yeah, I'm just going to use some of the last 16 colours for my tile map or my, uh, my background art as well. But of course, obviously, it's going to recolour your sprites on those systems. AGA doesn't have the same limitation. You can point it to another batch of 16 colours uh, in the, 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 eight, uh, the, the 256 colour registers you have available in AGA. But you just could be a little bit careful. So those second set of 16, you can use them in your bitmaps, but just be aware that your sprites are also going to use them as well. So, um, so you do have to just be aware of that sometimes with the various systems that you're developing for. Um, and you know, this just emphasises this, this grayscale business that I've been on about. So. Um, yeah, so if I'm just to show you this particular graphic here, and I can pull these up. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, da, 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 da. Um, uh, there it is. So I just want to show you how uh, keeping the palette separate actually results uh, in the final image. So, so I'm just going to show you the background only, and what you'll see is basically a perfect silhouette of where the characters are actually going to be, because this is literally. Those, those last set of 16 colours. So, it, yeah, quite effective. Now, I'd actually drawn the characters first, so that's why I've not actually filled in the bits behind. But uh, if I was animated or something, I'd probably want to do that, because otherwise I'd have to keep on drawing in bits to the background. Um, but yeah, I've managed to keep that to the, the, those 16 colours. And then if I show you um, our characters only, Lama and Pichan. Oh, not in the shell. That'd be interesting. <laughs> cannot, cannot run. This is it, yes. That's a good way to get a guru, I'm sure. <laughs> CD into this file somehow. There you go. Try again. There you go. Second time lucky. Um, so here you can see the characters. The, the projector's making these, these colours look a little bit washed out, so if you want to see any of these on the screen, just come and ask. But yeah, essentially it's perfectly cut out. Now, I did admittedly, because this wasn't really for a piece of game, I was just a bit of static art, I did actually draw this branch because I could reuse some of the, the sort of like the, the beige tones uh, for the tree bark or the, the, uh, the, the branches bark. So, so yeah, so that keeps it nice and separate. And then when you bring them all together, and I just do that. I always keep my work files, by the way, because I like to see the progress. It's, nice. it's also... Uh, good for other people to see it, and then you can bring them all together, and you've got the, the, the full composition, as it were. And you can see that all the things that I've been talking about using nicely stepped lines, anti aliasing, keeping the palette you know, perfectly managed, and so forth. You bring all those things together, and you put a bit of practice into it, and um, yeah, you, you, can, you can create marvelous things uh, using these, these old systems, so they're, they're wonderful to, to work on. So, um, just for the record, I use uh, a, a, an off-the-day optical mouse, um, Alpha Data Mega Mouse of some sorts. Obviously, there are modern alternatives as well, but I managed to get this for like a fiver, so fully boxed. So I was just like, yep, I shall use that. Um, but yeah, you can obviously get uh, a modern optical mouse from like Amiga Kit and Retro Ready One and all the others. Other sponsors are available. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, in, it's, it's, it's very... Uh, inspiring what you can you can get out of a uh, well in this case it's going to be I think this one's uh, 27 this year so happy birthday <laughs> so um, yeah I'm not getting emotional it's just because I drank too much last night um, <laughs> so um, but basically yeah it's, it's it's really cool what you can do with these systems and I think the thing is, is not to be put off by when you see... I mean, I, I do it myself. I, I flick through Twitter or whatever, and I see this amazing pixel art, and I think, oh, I'm not that good. But then, actually, you've got to turn that into something else, of like thinking, well, actually, I can do that. I can tease these ideas out of my own head. Never be put off by what other people put out there, because just be uh, inspired by what you potentially could create. And this is a great tool for doing it. 
you know, and I was, I was saying on the journey down uh, yesterday with uh, Anthony, Chris, like in the car, sometimes there's nothing more threatening than a blank canvas, but it also has that magical possibility of what could cre- uh, you could create. So just start, you know, don't feel like, oh, I'm going to do it exactly right like this. Just start putting stuff down, seeing what works for you, and just have fun with it. I mean, that's the whole point of doing this. If this was stressful, I wouldn't be doing it. And yes, it does occupy many hours over, maybe sometimes spread over many days or weeks or whatever, bits at a time. But this is a, a fabulous way to sort of switch off. It's also a meditative sort of thing. Um, so I just want to show you some of the bits that I've uh, done. You've seen some of them already. Um, but just before I do that, are there any questions at all uh, about what I've spoken about so far? All good. All good. Tuto bene. Okay, so... I'll just talk you through some of the, the graphics that I've got here and what I've done for them. It's a bit of a, a hodgepodge of stuff, but we'll, we'll see how far we get. So, 1M with logo. What's in here? This is like a magical mystery tour of stuff. So, okay, so this is... I've not actually finished this one, but I was trying to affect like a watercolour sort of effect with the sky, with pastel tones and so forth. And what I did for this was essentially I just, you know, flood-filled the sky with like a lightish yellow. And then I just basically brushed in using horizontal lines, just different shades of white and lighter <coughs> yellows and so forth. Super effective. Looks great on a CRT, and it almost looks like it's just a wash of colour. Um, the rest of the, the, the sort of the background, the foreground needs a bit more work, but the character's good, so I'm happy with that. So, but yeah, this this is actually a 32 colour image, but I was really trying to work on those those lighter shades. Another little top tip sometimes is when you have difficulty seeing the different shades is actually to work with slightly contrastier colours because you can always change those colours when you get to the end of it because that's the beauty of index colour and I'm going to mention that in a moment actually. Uh, so basically it's not like modern systems where you just use colour arbitrarily and basically the pixel holds the red, green and blue values within itself, chunky pixels essentially. Older systems use index colour including your Amiga so basically uh, through the bit planes basically but if we just keep it simple that pixel just has a number in it which says I'm colour number 16 or I'm colour number 24 or whatever it might be so so you can change the colours quite easily at the end so sometimes that's quite a good trick of doing it because sometimes working with these lighter tones can be very hard uh, to see the different shades and actually I think that's actually sometimes why when we look at particularly US gold um, games you know tier text destroyers of the world and so forth um, Sometimes when you look at their colours on like uh, a modern LCD or something like that, you think, well, why do they use such garish colours? And I think it's just actually sometimes, perhaps particularly on CRTs, they couldn't see the subtleties of the shades. And it's only now, with a clearer screen, that we can actually use that to good effect so we can see the subtler shades. But then when we put it back onto CRT, it looks even more magical because it's all blending beautifully. So, so yes. Um, so there's that one. Um, I'm not going to talk at length about all of these. Um, Free final, who knows? Oh, okay. So I always draw where I can with full overscan because that way when you put it on a CRT, you don't end up with unsightly borders. So again, essentially, the background is 16 colours and the foreground is the latter 16 colours. And uh, I, this one took quite some considerable time. But essentially, I just wanted to create something that looks almost like a still from an anime. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it took a long time to do, but... Very fulfilling when it was finished, and uh, when I plugged in the television to look at what it looked like, I was just like, ooh, that's, that's what I was looking for. So, um, And then, as I was saying about index colour and being able to rotate those hues, sometimes you won't have time to change everything. So what you can do is you can actually change those greens into pinks and make them blossom trees. Sure, you could probably improve it by actually changing the foliage shape, but perhaps if you're, you know, you're working on a tight deadline, Index colour actually gives you the advantage of being able to change things around a little bit. You know, maybe you can change the clothing colour or something like that. As long as you're palette managing correctly, so you're not using those green tones in the characters, you can very easily just rotate the hue in that palette like I uh, showed you at the very beginning, and it will do it all for you. So as long as you keep your darker tones, your shadow tones, um, shadows essentially, just change that colour. You can fiddle with the saturation a little bit if you want, but yeah, you can completely change a picture with only changing like four colours. It's, it's impressive what you can do with index colour. So chunky pixels are great, but index colour has its place as well. Um, I'm going to skip over that one. Just so you can see sort of how sketching sort of works. This is not a finished piece, as you might be able to tell in the moment. So this is a high-res interlaced picture. 
Uh, but you can see how I've started doing the CFR on the left here. So she's coming together. I've got a greyer uh, panel there, just so I can see all clearly. And you can see that Saichi on the right will eventually be all shaded in and so forth. So, yeah. so that's a work in progress. Uh, and then some of you may have seen this one last year. This one's a 32 color low res image. Um, this, oh no, it's not, sorry, beg your pardon. This is a high res interlace image again, because I just wanted to see if I can draw like a manga frame. But uh, admittedly, I did this on the LCD, because if I did this using a, a monitor, you know, like a CRT, oh, my eyes would have been shot to ruins. They already are raised, to be fair. But yeah, uh, that's the beauty of like the persistence of LCD. You don't have to put up with that flicker. But yeah, you can create some pretty high fidelity images on your high res interlace. Uh, this is a picture I thought you may have seen last year. Um, this one is a 32 color low res image. I basically shot around Google Street View, found a, a location in Tokyo that I like the look of, and I just basically sketched out the background roughly. It's not exactly like this particular street. And um, I was eventually uh, going to do a bit more work since, so it was actually a bitmap that panned across, um, but I hadn't actually got around to it yet, but draw more street scene essentially. But you can use various tools in Duet's Paint to sort of help you with the reflections, to change the transparency, so it'll pick a lighter tone or a darker tone and all this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, so yeah, that's sort of some of the stuff I do. And of course, again, the tones are very much hinting about that brooding sunset or something like that. So, but particularly on the CRT, th those oranges just leap off the screen. Um, uh, I'll skip over that one, actually. Um, I have plenty of stuff that's works in progress. Um, so I start drawing characters. These are all within the same 16 color palette. And eventually get these other characters drawn. But essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw like an imaginary game introduction screen for like uh, one of my favorite animes, Neon Genesis Evangelion. So uh, yeah, so it's, it's just fun to play about these things, see what detail you can get out of like 16 colors with all these characters. So I'm particularly pleased with Shinji in the middle there. So um, something about his eyes that I think are working really well. But yeah. Um, I'm probably moving on to more full screen stuff. This one's called Final. Final. I always call my final files final. So who knows what's in this one? So, um, oh, we've seen that one. So yeah, Lama and Pijan. So, um, oh, that, that I'm going to skip over. Um, we've seen that. Oh, hang on. Oh, that's the animation that you saw as well. So uh, I'm going to come back to that one, I think. Uh, this is just the background that you saw in that animation. So this is, um, it, I don't think, it is, I think this might actually only be 14 colors. I don't think I used the last two, maybe even three colors of the palette. It's loaded. Did it do it? Or did I just drag the file into the desktop? I did, didn't I? Yeah. Don't do this at home, folks. There you go. Um, so yeah, so I drew the separate to the, the sprites which I animated over the top. So, but again, you can see like the anti-aliasing is being used in the the hiragana at the top there. So, um, so yeah, so so Hiroha, uh, which means mum. It's like an archaic form apparently. Um, and then you've got sort of like differing to give these sort of almost like blooms of light. I'm almost done. <laughs> Um, and then to finish off uh, with, this was the pitch that I put in for this year's Amiga Island Creative, um, Commodore Creative Competition. Um, this one is a low-res interlace um, extra half-right image. I really wanted to push how far I could take the Amiga. Oh, no. Oh, no, this is an animation. <laughs> I'll show you that. In. So sometimes what I'll do is on a graphics tablet, I will draw the frames of an animation, but then I'll go over it with pixel art. So I've actually finished this one now, but I don't seem to have the file on this Amiga, unfortunately. So, but eventually it will be like a, a, a full animation which I can colour and so forth. So, but to be honest with you, it's no quicker doing it that way than it is actually doing it with the mouse. Well, for me anyway. Maybe some people will be quicker. But uh, it's just what, what process you enjoy. Yeah? Do you use the tablet with the Amiga? No. Well, oh. No, I just use it on the Mac. And then what I do is I convert the um, um, sketchbook frames to if images. Um, and yeah, and then just downscan to 16 colours or less so that I can trace over. So yeah, it's, it, it's not a faster method, it's just a different approach to animation, um, which, you know, I enjoy all of it. And then, just to finish off, I'll show you the picture that I put in for 
this year. So yeah, so this is a low res interlace picture. So your pixels are twice as wide as they are tall. It was a bit of a gamble because I've never actually really drawn anything properly um, using this mode on your Amiga, but I really wanted to see what you could do with the highest resolution that you can get out of um, an OCS ECS Amiga, except for some early AE1000s, because they don't support extra half bright, unfortunately, um, and uh, see where we could get to without any ham fringing as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, I could do more to this, but overall, uh, I feel that it came out pretty well. So, um, yeah, so there was more detail I wanted to put into it. But by basically picking those shades correctly and then spending ages drawing the sky and then obviously Lamar and Akane, um, it all comes over quite nicely. So these old computers, like your Amiga 500s and most 1000s, and your 2000s and your 3000s can chuck out a very colourful image and all it needs is a little bit of imagination, a bit of braveness to face that blank canvas and uh, just to put your mouse to screen. So good luck, guys. I think you can all be fabulous artists and yeah just have fun with it it really is just it's just a fun journey all of this so and just don't get distracted playing rainbow islands too often like i do so damn it <laughs> so uh, yeah thank you for listening <laughs> I think that's good. <laughs> are there any questions that i can answer? can i get a picture of all you guys here i've, I've brought my professional kit as i say i'm a, a photographer so I didn't want to muck about with any of this silly digital camera stuff, so I splashed out on a disposable. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to see what happens. Don't do this at home again, kids. So. Yeah, this is it. So after three. Three, two, one. Amigo! Yeah, I think that's in focus. <laughs> thank you, guys. It's been such a pleasure to share with you. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I, yeah. Yeah. Once you get over those few initial nerves of talking, but <laughs> oh, it's okay. Yeah. The idea was I had all those boxes that I could call it on my Mac using HP because I've got a splitter as well, so they can still plug in subjects and I've got all the power cables, didn't I? So, yeah. It's a new sort of way to do it with these three. Okay. So, I'll send it on. This is it. Send it all to me and we'll see what we need. Yeah, this is it. I can strip you all the way to me. And of course, yeah, the whole your whole talk was recorded and live streamed out, and you had by far the most well attended talk of the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to bring everything but the computer, and if you just carry the computer. Do I need to disconnect? Everything? Nope, nope. We're going to leave the stream oh, okay. running. That's Everything's fine. going to be. This is this is not recommended grab, by anyone. Uh, oh, hey Paul, boss man, can you get the uh, my phone tripod? Yes, thank you. Oh, and also that whatever that is, yes. <laughs> whatever that is, one of many cables. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay, this has actually worked out great because my talk is just going to be with Dave because BP and Trevor have already gotten the limelight. So oh, right, okay. Because most of the questions are for, for Dave. Yeah, we're going to have to get you like a golf trolley or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're doing so well. Uh, you're going over the top. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Paul. Okay. Where is Erling? Oh, he's over there. I just want to see if we're going to be here or if he's going to move this over. Or... 
because what I was thinking, Pix, if it wouldn't be too much, is if you could actually just sit right in front of us with the computer in your lap. Okay, yeah, sure. And, um, and that way, and if you need to adjust the gain on the microphone, you can just turn the, the old knob there. Oh, awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, it's nice to have sort of this is like the standard microphone that everybody has. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, I think before this was... Last year he wants me on his show. What's this now about? Show you trying to get on, right? What's that? Who's show you trying to get on? That's from when he went to the army show. Oh, that was from uh, when Doug interviewed Trevor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. I don't need to be on any more shows. Come on, enough. I don't know you guys at the time.
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's put that however. I wonder why that's doing that. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> because there's less stuff in the room. Right, lip. right. There's less things that can yeah. be causing interference. And that's plugged in somewhere totally out of... Uh, Oh yeah, it looks great. It looks great. Yeah, it's like uh, what's that inside the actor studio? We just need some potted plants.
Hello everybody, we're not too far away from the end of the day yet, um, we're going to have a chat with uh, our first time ever guest from the States, Dave Haney who is with us for the first time, and to do the interview is John Shaw from the Amigos podcast, and this is going to be streamed to the Amigos podcast channel. So, would you please put your hands together for Mr. Dave Haney. Probably not easy to recreate. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah, okay. Big stage mic on the floor. Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh, no. We're off and running. Hello? Yep. That's, I think that was the on button. No one ever knows how these things work. No. It's a mystery. Yours works. Mine works. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody... <clears throat> oh, boy. Yeah. Does anybody know where the third microphone is? The third microphone. This one is not. This. Maybe we can replace it. Or if someone has two AA batteries. Double <laughs> A battery. Come on. I'm going to freak you all out. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. It's 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 got a little battery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. So yeah. We'll just 
Yeah, I'll try and not bore you too much. <laughs> Are you from, where are you from originally? Uh, originally I'm from New Jersey, USA. I uh, was born in Summit, New Jersey, and I lived there almost my whole life. Three years, four years ago I moved to Delaware, across the river. Oh. So, very adventurous, I moved a whole 30 miles away from wow. my house. So when you, <laughs> when you worked for Commodore, yeah. you, were, you were living in, in New Jersey? Yeah, yeah I, was, I actually had a house that was like right near the bridge, because South Jersey where I lived was kind of like an island, like you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't leave New Jersey except by a couple bridges or possibly the ferry if you went all the way to the end. So, yeah, we lived really close. We lived within like five miles of the bridge to Pennsylvania. And my wife worked and still works in Jersey. So we couldn't, move, we couldn't, we didn't have too much flexibility. Plus, for some reason, I just never wanted to live in a landlocked state. Mm. I always want to be somewhere near the water. <laughs> so how, how, did you, uh, how did you get hired at Commodore? So uh, right out of college, I was working at General Electric right out of college. It was, it was one of those things where they, you know, you had on-campus on interviews and um, that was the offer I got. And um, if it had been a few months later, I might have wound up working for Prime Computer near Boston. But they gave me an offer. They're, they also went out of business, so <laughs> wouldn't have helped. Um, but uh, General Electric promised me space shuttle. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to build rockets. That's cool. Um, when I got there, I wasn't actually in, I hadn't gotten a security clearance yet, but they were clearly working on nuclear missiles. And I said, no, thanks. Um, so uh, it took me a little while to get up the, the courage to leave because you're not really supposed to just work for a, a company for a few months right out of college, but I did anyway. Um, so I had sent, I looked through pre-internet, looked through the local Philadelphia paper to find the one headhunter who wasn't asking for two years experience, <laughs> sent my resume out um, on a Tuesday. They called me at work on Thursday. I was wearing a homemade shirt that day. I was, I was rebelling against the whole General Electric thing where all these kids from college were slowly melting into the infrastructure and starting to look like everyone else at General Electric. Um, so I went to the headhunter. And I get into uh, the office, and there's this John Lennon-looking guy with round glasses and long hair, longer than mine. And um, it's like, you know, hi. I'm like, yeah, hey, I'm here for an interview. You too? He's like, yeah, sort of. And um, so we, uh, we started talking a little bit, and um, then they brought me in, and there was a normal suit guy who, uh, with a bad comb over, um, turned out that was, that was Joe Krizuki, who was the uh, head of engineering at the time. And um, I had interviewed with him, then they brought me into another room, and there's that John Lennon-looking guy, who was Bill Hurd, <laughs> who asked me, um, about if I knew Laplace transforms, he showed me an he showed me an operational amplifier circuit with a little diode in there, and asked me what that was for. And I said that's to limit the swing so it doesn't saturate, and a few other questions. And then um, basically they said uh, you should come and visit us on Monday at the plant. And when I went to that was that was Thursday. I went I went to the plant on Monday, and they said you're hired. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> what was your what was your experience with personal computers up to that point? Okay, so in 1977, my best friend Scott had gotten an inheritance and decided he wanted a personal computer. And we went to the computer store on the island of Manhattan in New York. And this computer store was to call it a store was a bit of an exaggeration. It was a one room office, one room office in a, an office building, one end of the building had, or one end of this little room had 4K Apple IIs, the other end had Commodore PET 2001s. And so Scott bought a Commodore PET. That was the first time I touched a personal computer. I had played around a little bit with hobby computers, but the thing was before this, I taught myself basic using, hello, uh-oh. Sorry. Right. <laughs> we have a, uh, is this on? No. 
Yes, hello? Hello, testing, one, two. Oh, ah, there we go, okay. Yeah, actually, this, this sounds a little bit better. Um, so, so yeah, um, I, uh, I had taught myself basic. My dad was bringing, my dad had brought home, foolishly, when I was like 12 years old, had brought home a, an HP calculator that was the size of a, like a large desktop computer. Um, it used core memory, it had little magnetic cards, and um, well, he brought it home to work on his taxes, but when he wasn't using it, I was playing around with it, and um, in about a week, I had gotten tired of the, the NIM game and a few other things, and I started taking, this is just on my day, it's cut, cutting in and out. Anyway, um, I started taking apart the, uh, the, the programs, figuring how they worked, and after that computer went away, I'm like, I, like Hello. Yeah. So I, I was like, my dad. You know, I asked him, can you can you get me bring home a computer again? He says, well, we have a we have a mainframe at the office. No one uses it on the weekend. So he started bringing home a TI Silent 700 terminal that printed on thermal paper. And every weekend, I got to work on computers until the paper ran out. <laughs> one roll of thermal paper. Not not the best ecology move there, but <laughs> but I did I did teach myself basic and Fortran over the next couple of years, and so when Scott got his pet, I already knew how to program basic, um, and I had also been reading. I read Kilobot, microcomputing, I read Creative Computing, um, all the all the you know the the hobbyist magazines. I was learning a little bit about electronics, in the context of computers, and so. Um, in 79, I actually had a family inheritance when my grandfather died, and I bought a, an Exidy Saucer, which is a computer almost no one ever heard of. Um, it was a Z80, or a Z80, since I'm not in the USA anymore. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, it was, it had, came with 16K, but it had sockets for another 16K. And I, I very shortly found a place that would sell me 16K for the low sum of 19.99, which was amazing because, like a couple of years before, you were paying about about $100 for 16K of RAM, DRAM. Um, when I got it, it had no cassette interface. Well, it had a cassette interface built into the system that was that came out the serial port. The it had a, a, a regular DB25 serial port, the old-fashioned kind, but. Every, as everyone knows, of course, the DB25 serial port actually could support two RS-232 ports. They only had one, but they also had a cassette interface. I had a little, regular, old-fashioned cassette player from Radio Shack, um, which I immediately tore apart, put in a DB25 connector, short-circuited over some of the analog circuitry to the point where I could get kind of a digital tape drive out of it. That was control, also controlled motor on and off from from the um, from the Exidy, and so I built my tape drive. I also ended up building my own monitor, sort of. Is that I? My mom had given me a TV for my birthday, the previous year, um, just a black and white TV, and it was it was a Hitachi black and white TV, and she got it mostly because a friend of hers worked at a uh, at a place that did um, RVs, and this was an RV television, and that you could. All that you could plug it into 110 volts, but it also work off of 12 volts. Mm -hmm. So it turned out this was one of the best TVs ever for modding. And I went down to the local radio in Lincroft, New Jersey. I rode my 10 speed to Lincroft, New Jersey, and got a uh, copy of Sam's Photo Facts for this Hitachi television that showed me right where the where the composite video was. And I put in a big old Frankenstein-looking switch that allowed me to switch that circuit back into its normal path or switch it to a little transistor <laughs> amplifier I built. And that transistor amplifier then went to a, a, a screw on a coax jack at the end. So I could, basically what I did was I built the, I, I built my own version of the yellow RCA jack that's on every television since the 80s. You were the inventor. I I put I may I probably had one of the first TVs ever with composite video in, because uh, I tried a modulator and the Exidy actually had a higher bandwidth video than most of the early personal computers. It did 64 characters, not just it was black and white. It had programmable characters. It had a 
It had character graphics like the pet, but half of them were programmable. Uh, the only problem was if you use the built-in clear screen function in basic, it reset all the programmable characters. So one of the first things I did was write an assembly language routine that cleared the screen without doing that. <laughs> and uh, and I, um, I wrote programs for that. Um, I sold the programs to about 10% of the people who bought that computer in the US, which was like 500 people, because no one bought it. Um, at the summer of 79, I made more money in software selling, I wrote programs and sold a couple tapes to a uh, creative computing magazine that had their own software business. They were selling software on tapes back then. The previous summer, I had worked at a uh, summer camp washing dishes and didn't make, you, <laughs> didn't make as much money. So I was like, yes, computer science is great. It was still you know, pocket change, basically, but it was, but it was like, it was, it, was a, it was a moderate, meaningful, successful thing. I kept that computer through college. When I was out of college, um, I was working on a house for my mom. My mom and her business partner owned a kennel, and they had bought this horrible, horrible house. So they spent like $25,000 to buy a house. So you can sort of imagine what kind of house you get for $25,000, not a whole lot. Um, and it needed a lot of work. And I'm good at carpentry and fixing things up and wiring things in. And I put in a water heater and I did some wiring and I built a wall so the bathroom didn't have just a curtain covering it. And one night I was up at my friend Max's house in central Jersey in the fog, stayed overnight because of the fog. I came home and my house had been robbed, burglarized. And they took the exity. Strangely enough, they left my speakers. They took my turntable, they took my amplifier, they left the speakers, which eventually wound up in the Commodore lab. <laughs> um, and uh, I was not too happy about this. They took my, they took my Olympus OM-1 camera, but left all the lenses. So I eventually replaced that. But it was, it was just, it was very, very tragic. And so I ended up uh, later that year buying a Commodore 64, and that, was right before I ended up getting the job at Commodore. Now, when you started at Commodore, you were working directly under Bill, right? Yeah. So what, yeah. Were, what were some of the projects, your first projects over there? Um, well, I, I had started with Bill in the middle of the TED project, which w eventually became the C16 and the, and the Plus Four. Um, neither of those were really what it was supposed to be, but the C16 was close. They started that project as Jack was afraid of the Sinclair. Sinclair came over with their Z80 machine for 100 bucks. And Jack was like, no, we cannot be undersold. We have to have a computer for 100 bucks. And obviously, we're going to make a C64 sell for 100 bucks. Um, after Jack left, so I started in the fall of 83. Jack left right after the CES show in 84 when they introduced the Plus 4, or they introduced the 264, 364. They weren't, it wasn't called the Plus 4 yet. Um, I'm pretty convinced that, um, that his sons were still working there and just basically trying to cause a little chaos by boosting this thing up to be a much bigger computer than it was supposed to be. Um, so apparently all of the, almost all the TED computers sold as the C16 in South America. <laughs> but um, but I, did, I was doing like the timing diagrams. We had, for that machine, we had a big acetate sheet with timing diagrams. And we documented every little nanosecond, which basically meant me documented every little nanosecond um, to make sure it all worked. Um, in fact, later on, when I was on the C128, I started doing that with, I, there was a spreadsheet on the VAX that allowed a spreadsheet to call other spreadsheets in. So I built spreadsheet models for each DRAM we could possibly use. Each chip, they were all pulled into this big simulation that was done in a spreadsheet that did all the timing for the C128, worst case, best case, so we would know if anything failed. And there was one parameter that in absolute worst case was minus one nanosecond. Everything else worked. <laughs> was there any sense on, on, the, on the TED team that you were in fact cannibalizing existing C64 sales as you were working on it, or did that just come in, in hindsight? We never really thought about cannibalizing the C64. The plus four stuff came so late in the project. Um, they had some ideas about selling it as an education machine with built-in, so the, the extra set of ROMs could be used for a variety of things. Uh, there was one version 
they had done that had a word processor built into it. There's another version that had logo built into it, which would have been good for educational. So for a little while, they were trying to figure out things that they might have done with the, with the 264 that we still called it that wouldn't have that might maybe made it a little bit of an advantage over a C64. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem was that you know this thing came out and like everybody else who tried to compete with the C64, you couldn't. Yeah. C64 C64 had already pretty much won the microcomputer business because it all the software was for the C64. It was kind of like trying to come up with an alternative to the IBM PC. If you found a good niche, maybe you could. But once the PC was, not, not in the early days, but once the PC was out and cheap, no one really successfully competed against it because everyone could make one because it was cheap. The Commodore 64, of course, only Commodore could make, but there were, you know, they were selling two million a year. And that was a lot of computers back then. <laughs> so, yeah, I, it, was, it was, I mean, we really had very little to say about how the thing was sold. Um, you know, you, you kind of like, and we were both, you know, we were both in our 20s. We were not like, you know, experienced computer people. Bill, Bill, Bill was a self-taught engineer. Um, if you ever had to debug something, he was the guy you wanted in the room with you. That guy, he showed me some tricks that, you know, I use to this day. Um, I had more of the formal education, so we made actually a very good team. Um, and then we brought in, uh, for the C128, we also brought in Frank Palaya, who knew the Z80. Um, and um, yeah, it's pretty much, you know. So you really have a hand in every non-C64 model of the Commodore <laughs> right? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, after the C64, yes. I mean, obviously there was all the pet stuff and everything. And, you know, I had, you know, I had friends like my friend Fred Bowen, who currently works with my company, was, uh, was, was working on the uh, cutting ruby lift for the 6502, <laughs> mm. you know, like really far back. So, you know, there's some of those, some of my Commodore friends were there long before I was. But, yeah, I was, after the C64, I was pretty much, at least had a fingerprint on, all, on almost all the stuff that happened until... Later in the Amiga years, when there was just a whole lot of a whole lot of work going on, and I, you know, I couldn't have had been involved in everything. Yeah. Well, let's let's move on to the Amiga years. Okay. Tell, Tell me about the very first time you heard about the Amiga. The very first time I heard about the Amiga was at CES 1984, that same show that we were de debuting. The um. Well, actually, no, it was 1985. CES 1985 was the first time. Actually, I had heard a little bit about it, but this was. Seeing it in person, um, we were showing off the C128, it, and it was it was not done yet. In fact, it was funny. We were driving. Bill and I came in on the same plane. We're in a taxi driving to the hotel. There's a big old billboard up there that talks about the C128, and that was the first time either of us found out that the C128 was expandable to 512K. <laughs> that was something the marketing people decided. And they were, and they, and of course they were telling everybody. So we ended up actually having to redesign a few things to, and, and then you know, uh, we had, we, Frank also did this, uh, the REU, the, the memory module that wasn't really expandable, but it was, it, it met the legal qualifications that they had committed themselves to. Um, and uh, while we were there, um, Bill had managed to um, talk to some of the Amiga guys, and we ended up back in one of the Amiga suite. It was me, Bill, RJ, and Dave Needle, um, and some beer. <laughs> and, and we took apart the Amiga, and the Amiga 1000, and looked inside, and we Bill and I both cracked up laughing because they had um, the original Daphne chip. It wasn't the Denise yet. The, the display chip had a tower. You know, a tower is, you guys probably know what a tower is even if you don't know the name. It's when you have a circuit board that plugs into a socket. We always called those towers. So they had a tower, which basically meant that they were adding some stuff to that chip to make it work. We had a tower in the, uh, in the, in the C128. You were kindred experience. In fact, that's, that tower had been, see, that had been like our preoccupation for a month because the, uh, the 8563 80 column chips didn't work very well. So at Chris, between Christmas and New Year's, it was me and Ted Lunthy, the head of chip development, 
going through a huge pile of 8563 chips trying to find some golden ones, while Bill Hurd and Dave Diario, who designed the, uh, the, the VIC chip, had, were building a tower to try to make it sync with the bus because it wasn't properly syncing. I actually, I was the first one to turn the chip on and try to make it work. I wrote some code for it and got it to do some displays, but what I found out was you, you kind of had to tell it everything twice. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So the guy who designed it, Kim Eckert, was from Texas. <coughs> so we started, we started calling re registers you had to write, you had to tell a couple times, we started calling those Texas registers. I don't know if it ever made the jargon file, but it should. <clears throat> anyway, Kim was, Kim was on vacation in Texas while his boss and me were doing all this testing and Bill and Dave were trying to come up with this way of, of synchronizing it, which worked. The problem is it was using a phase lock loop circuit and a phase lock loop will lock onto a frequency, but you kind of have to tune it if it isn't locked to get it to lock. And that tuning changes with temperature. So at the, on the CES show floor, um, we had all these marketing guys doing things they shouldn't be doing with C128s. We had a bunch of them out there, all, and we had, we had picked the, 80, the ones that had the best 80 column display to show off the 80 column display. And um, all these guys, all these marketing guys were power cycling, because they didn't know there was a reset button. You didn't even have to power cycle. They were power cycling them, and then they wouldn't come up because the 80 column chip wasn't responding. So I was walking around the floor of CES with a can of free spray and a little plastic tweaking tool, getting C128s to go back for like the first two days before I had kind of whipped these guys. And I mean, I was just this kid, right? I was you know, 22 years old, whipping them into shape, saying, you know, you gotta do this, you gotta, 23, excuse me. Um, and eventually that that stopped. But so we, so we, we were invited to this suite and, we were just, you know, we exchanged war stories, and that was my first introduction to both uh, Amiga, pe Amiga people, and yeah, they were like us. They were, they were the same, the same kind of people, and that was a good introduction because eventually, Westchester was going to start stealing away Amiga jobs. Right. <laughs> Even then, as you were looking at the sort of hardware picture of the system, did you tell it was something special and something unique? Well. Then I knew it was something unique because the graphics demos, the, there wasn't, the, the whole operating system wasn't working yet, but they had all those demos that every, you know, that became famous, the Robo City and that, like nobody had seen anything like that on a, on a personal computer. Most people had never seen anything like that on any computer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was cool. And then in talking to them, and I was talking to Needle about DMA channels and things like that, and I'm like, this is the way you're supposed to build a computer. Um, you know, obviously in 8-bit we didn't really have those abilities, but um, so it was, I mean, I guess in some ways it was still my formative years as a, as a computer engineer, but it was like, no, this is, it struck me as this is the right way to do things. And to this day, still, they didn't make any mistakes. Now, what, what if any work had Commodore been doing on a 16-bit architecture before the acquisition? <laughs> there is the Commodore 900. Commodore 900 was a was basically going to be a little baby Sun 2. It was running the coherent operating system, which was a Unix clone before the days of Linux. Um, they had both a megapixel display and a multi-terminal server, a little a little um, serial port with a processor on it, um, and that was that was done by one team that couldn't get it to work. So it was kind of tabled for a little while. Then they brought in another team who couldn't get it to work. So they, and then finally, Bob Welland and George Robbins took over that project and made it work. And it was actually a very good design. It was, um, there was uh, this guy Rico Tudor did the graphics. He eventually worked, ended up working for B Incorporated. Um, he had his own windowing system. It was an X Windows. It was ridiculously fast. Fastest windowing system you will ever see, because all he cared about was having windows to run the Unix shells in. He, you know, wasn't wasn't trying to do anything really, um, you know, the kind of stuff that most people were doing with windowing systems. He just wanted everything to be ridiculously fast. So, so it had it ran Rico Windows. It was very simple user interface. It had used a mouse, and it was a good system. Um, 
I'm not sure Zilog's systems had a whole lot of future in them, but they had they had already been used in um, many computers. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, CBM Vax replaced our original CBM computer, which was a um, which was a Z8000 based computer that. Um, George, George had bought like all of the computers when Exxon got out of the data systems division. They had this. They had made a Z8000 Unix machine that they they got out of the business, and he bought up like a whole truckload of of these systems that he was then putting into places. And that was our first computer that accessed the internet at Commodore. Um, so that system, sadly, when when we bought Amiga. The company wasn't in really good health anyway, and they had decided that only one 16-bit system could go forward. And because, in a good part, because they bought, they had spent all this money on Amiga, but also because Amiga, being games capable, was a lot closer to what Commodore was used to than selling something that was essentially a baby Sun 2. Now, from the beginning, poetry. Did the top brass at Commodore see the Amiga as a business slash productivity machine or another games machine in terms of an earner? It's hard to say what the top brass actually thought as going up to you know, to this Commodore International level. Um, at engineering level, um, we our our boss, um, Henry Rubin, when he was our boss, made it a point to have the best Amiga on his desk at all times. So he was using spreadsheets, he was doing business guy stuff with it. But I mean, mostly, I think there was, there was the impression with a lot of people that this was a creativity product, you know, that kind of create, it was a different kind of computer. It wasn't really going up against IBM PC. And you know, you look at the launch, you know, Andy Warhol and Debbie Harry, you know, and that is the kind of, I mean, it really, that was the strength, was you could do music, you could do video, you could do stuff that was really, really difficult to do on the IBM PC. After Commodore, I actually started trying to do some music on the IBM PC. Back then, it helped to be a computer engineer because most of the time it failed. And um, in fact, I got a lot of free software. Well, I got a, a package from, uh, from um, uh, Sonic Foundry of free software that they had written, you know, I had acid in Vegas because I had successfully um, both helped and defended one of their guys on the PC dog group where everyone was sort of like trying to figure out how stuff worked. And I wrote this whole diatribe about how everything worked just basically to end the discussion. Mm -hmm. And this guy, Peter Haller, was like, oh, I, you know, you basically, you know, you basically saved my day. Here, have this software. I'm like, yes, okay, this is great. <laughs> But, it, you know, PC days, but um, yeah, it was clearly, um, and you know, and you know, you looked at, I wasn't even looking at applications at the time, I was a computer nerd, right? I was looking at like, look at all the stuff this does. So we started getting a little bit of Amiga stuff in the summer of 85. Um, they sent like one or two Lorraine boxes, which were the big black metal cases with the expansion chimney. They handed out a very, very small number of the green bound ROM kernel manuals. That was like all, all the Amiga books in one at that time. And you had to sign your name to get one. And Bill Hurd was able to get one. And the very day he got that, I stayed late and photocopied the thing. <laughs> so I, totally illegally, but I wanted to learn everything there was to know about this computer. And over the next week, I, I read the whole book. Um, and I actually, I felt a little bad because like, that summer, the, the 128 came out. I was doing a regular, um, I was doing a regular show every month on Quantum Link with Fred Bowen, answering C128 questions, and yet my heart was starting to go somewhere else. Starting to drift. Um, when you, after the acquisition happened, and you were officially working on the Amiga, what were some of the first things that you were assigned? Well. So after the C128, Bill Hurd left the company. I was there with Frank Pelea, and we were sort of trying to justify our existence. Um, we made two halves of a Commodore 256. I made one that supported 256K of RAM, and Frank made one that allowed the Z80 to run at full 4 megahertz, 4.02 megahertz, 4.04 megahertz, whatever. Anyway, um, and um, 
we were trying we were trying to sell the company on hey remember us we want a job and after a while there was just like nobody was interested in in making a, a new 8-bit computer but um, George Robbins wanted some help on the uh, A500 and there was some thought among management like local not not top level brass but like Jeff Porter and, and Henry that I might be the guy to lead the A500 project and they would give George the 2000 which they'd been working on in Germany because no, but nobody wanted to use the A1000 parts to build the A2000 they wanted to use the A500 parts because they were going to cost less and maybe we could integrate some more problem was because George of course had done the C900 he was that guy right he was the high-end guy I was the low end I was the the senior most remaining low-end guy because I was there you know, two years before or a year and a half before Frank and um, George said no this is my baby you can't have it mm. so they gave me the 2000 wow. <laughs> and it was like holy shit <laughs> but um, but I you know I so I you know so I, I you know it wasn't like I was in a vacuum I was working with George he was you know, he was basically a month ahead of me on the on the A500. I was taking all the stuff he did on the A500, figuring out what to do with that in terms of the A2000. Um, we didn't need, you know, they had that extra slot in there that was essentially the edge connector from the 1000 that was going to be used for CPUs. We knew that. In fact, already Bob Welland was working on a on a 68020 board to run Lint, to run Unix. Those Unix guys just never gave up. Um, <laughs> But, um, and actually a little bit before that, he was even building his own MMU cache chip. So it took a little while before we saw the 68,020 because that was kind of, a, that was kind of a, a second, you know, that was sort of plan B when it came to uh, um, building this new system. But anyway, um, so, you know, I, I, so I worked on the 500 for about a month. So like I said, small fingerprints, mm -hmm. um, enough to learn the whole system at a you know at a hardware engineer level rather than just reading the books and stuff. Then I went on to the 2000 um, because of this whole C this slot. I said, well, the CPU should be able to basically should be able to take over the slot. Um, we, I started planning to put all of the PLDs that they were using to run the expansion bus into a, a separate chip. We called we ended up calling Buster. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't catch the mistake the Germans had made in their PAL equations, so the first buster ended up getting its own little tower because it had, there was one mistake in there in that when a Zora device masters the bus, the buffers from the main board are supposed to point the other way, and they weren't. So you, it, it, when you're talking to, like, so Zoro, like a you know an 85, um, I don't know a DMA card talking to a, a, you know a, a 8052 memory card or something, um, whatever yeah um, the the DMA across the bus was was getting interrupted by noise from the main bus and it was just it was that was the one thing that failed because now the Germans once I found this problem they said okay we'll just reprogram our pals. Wow, I had to go and re I had to go and rev the chip. <laughs> I felt bad about that because I just it was it was a lot to take on in a very short period of time, and that was one thing I didn't understand well enough to have found the problem initially. Once I saw it there on the bench, it was easy to find. Um, so um, so you know so I, I that's when I, that's what I launched into the two thousand when that was done. I joined Bob Welland in getting the uh, twenty six twenty board done. Um, he left to go work for Apple about halfway through that and ended up being like one of the main guys on the Newton. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it just went on from there. Um, yeah. Well, well, I've been told that it's time that we wrap this up. Oh, no. I know. I feel like I could talk to you for the rest of the night, but thank you so much. I can. For, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and my, my you guys. might need to refill my beer at some point. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Okay. I mean, there's something after me. You didn't leave me to the end. I know, I know. <laughs>
Okay, folks, if you stay with us for uh, just a minute, we're going to have Dan Wood and uh, David Cousins, who are going to come to make an announcement about uh, some new developments in Friends. Do we have? They'll be, okay, we're we'll probably talking less than five minutes, okay? That's what's up next. Thanks. Is